the lunch. Of course, we are in track number uh, one. Uh, several talk ahead of us. Uh, this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Zbyszko. He is currently working in Brainly. Brainly is a Krakow company, but he works in the uh, Three City. Uh, normally, the stuff is uh, yeah. Big applause, please. Three City. <laughs> Uh, normally it is like that, that uh, speakers are on the stage, they have interesting lectures and they then, then they get uh, the gift pack after their talk uh, to, uh, to thank them that uh, they had a great talk, uh, to thank them for, the, uh, for being with us. But uh, Zbyszko uh, asked for the gift pack yesterday. And it's I, cold here. And really cold. Uh, he was saying he is cold and so on, so on. So I, I am wondering uh, whether he is not so sure that uh, his presentation will be at the uh, high level. But uh, I hope it will. Uh, so uh, the stage is yours. Uh, and it's now 45 minutes uh, for you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, first disclaimer. Uh, I will only mention Java twice, and one was already done, so if you really are hoping for Java in this presentation, you will probably be disappointed. But if you want to hear about search engineering, that's the place to be, and that's what I want to talk about. But before that, let me introduce myself. Uh, like, actually, Kuba already did that. Uh, I'm Zbyszko. Um, I'm a senior software search engineer in, at Blainly. Brainly is a company that does this sort of stack overflow for kids, but better. Uh, we help uh, schoolers to learn stuff, uh, but I also work on search in a few of my previous companies. I work for, on Wikipedia search, for example, at some point, and I'm also an co-organizer of uh, Java user group in Tri-City. Yes. Ah, oh, well, I was okay. -ish. Jesus. Okay, so um, I will cut out the fragment uh, in the next because I, I overdid it. Okay, uh, so this talk is, will be about search. I want to give a small context what a, what a search is, at least for me, and general understanding of what that process entails. Search is a process of finding information relevant to the user. That's it. That's all there is to it. Thank you. Oh, I made it in time. Uh, so, uh, and. You probably use search a lot, like Google, obviously, but many of your applications you use, the, your applications have some sort of search. But many do not. Many applications do not feel the need of having something like this. Uh, many applications tend to rely on organic searches, using, for example, Google, and getting to the content they create this way. Uh, and obviously, that would be a bad business for me to say, do that, so I'm going to convince you otherwise. And this part is about why it makes sense to add to your application search. So this is a colorized version of a battlefield when people try to uh, get from Google, uh, get users from Google to their own sites or applications and so on. Uh, if you're using this way of approaching your content, this means that you're competing with uh, very many people. You might have a great search opt engine optimizations, but so they do. So uh, you're always on the battlefield at this point. Uh, another thing that is important is that you actually know your users. I mean, there are multiple ways that people can engage your, your, your product. In many situations, uh, uh, those are very specific to the domain that you're doing. Like, for example, uh, in our case, questions and answers. We know that our users are kids. They have their specifics when it comes to in, uh, interacting. For example, a lot of typos. Um, but in general, you know your content and you know your user, at least you should know your user. If you're not, you're probably doing this. You could do it better. So that helps you to create a more tailored, a, a, a tailored experience for them rather than using it something more general like Google. And third, and last but not least, search is essential for mobile applications. And we want to have mobile applications because that's how we retain our users. I mean, if if they like using application, they will not go back to Google to find something. They would be just keep using the application. And that means that you have to have your own search. And it has to work, uh, work, work well, otherwise users will stop using your app. OK. Um, so this is the why. I'm, I'm hoping that it convinced you. Um, and I promised this, that this presentation will go from SQL to something that is usable for users. And that's not my favorite part, so I'll do it quickly. Let's search something in the database. I know, I know there are better ways of doing that, but let's start at the beginning. We want to find all the documents 
that contain the word fox inside of a title. There's this, this thing. No. Yay. This like formula, many of you probably know it. And generally, you do something like this and it will find documents. Sounds cool. Obviously, it's, super, it's really rather slow. I mean, there are ways of making it faster, but it's basically something similar to regex and it will not be fast. And that's, those are the issues with it. And, but let's pretend that's okay. Let's go a little bit further and we want to find brown foxes. There are probably not many of those, but uh, let's imagine we want to find something like this. And again, we will find some documents, but this document, for example, will not be, uh, will not be in the results because the, you know, the wording is different, the different order of those words. And so this means we have to improve. And what we can do, we can obviously split. This process we just did here is called tokenization. We took some text, we divided it by space, and we have tokens. So we have this, brown, fox, now we can find something. But we'll not find this. And that is a very contrived example, I know. That was the whole point of it. Um, but obviously, from the logical perspective, there is a brown fox there somewhere. But because we have a bit different form, this will not suffice. And obviously, it's very hard to like, do something with it uh, purely from SQL perspective. Uh, one disclaimer, I know that there are uh, full text uh, search engines in, in databases. Uh, if you really don't want to bother, you can probably use them. Uh, but from my perspective, if you want to engage with search, you have to go a bit, bit further. And this presentation isn't very technical, but I will mention a few technologies before I go to actual search engineering. Uh, most of you probably will know this. I know, actually, most of you because yesterday uh, our keynote speaker mentioned this. I will probably go a bit, a bit more detailed than he did. So first thing is first. The structure that is always or quite often used for search is called inverted index. And inverted index is a structure you are all very familiar with because you've seen it in a, every single book you've ever read. As, uh, maybe uh, not every single, but many uh, places that you go to the end and there's this index of this word appeared on those and those and those pages and so on. That's inverted index, basically. Uh, and technology we mostly use for that is Apache Lucene. Again, you, said, you heard about it yesterday. And the actual index in, in, in criminal simplification looks like this. You have your tokens, you have your information about how many uh, tokens appear in general in documents, and IDs of those documents. This kind of uh, notation allows you to quickly get the list of, for example, if you want to all application, all fast application, uh, fast app documents, you can quite easily compare those two lists, for example, those are cross posting lists, and get the common parts like one, six, and so on and so on. Uh, postings list is a sort of a list that allows a quick lookup of those elements, so it really helps. Uh, but the problem with this part is actually I said we want to find fast applications, right? Word app isn't application, it's a different word. And in the end, when you search in an inverted index, at the end of all of this, there's an equals. Basically, two strings are being compared, and that's it. So if app is not equal application, we will not find those documents. So we need to do something about this. Uh, the process that tries to normalize them is called analysis. And in Lucene, we have chains, we have analyzers, or analyzer chains that compose of few elements. We have car filters. Car filters are sort of, you take the whole text and you do something with that text. You have tokenizers, which split, and token filters that work on tokens. Uh, to give you an example, let's say this is the document you want to index. The index contains, uh, the document contains uh, uh, HTML tags, which obviously is not something we want. So the first part would be used to use car filter that's called HTML strip car filter, which removes those tags. And then we can proceed to the tokenization phase. Uh, actually, one more the car filter. There can be more car filters. Uh, this one uh, lower cases all, all, the, all the text. And now we have a tokenizer. Tokenizer is only there once. I mean, it makes no sense to have more tokenizers. Um, in this case, standard tokenizer basically takes some uh, grammar rules about splitting the text, you know, the, uh, the general ones for English language. It works on Polish as well. And uh, creates tokens out of this. 
And in the end, we, have the, we had this brownish, for example. So we have to do a token something to, like, m to make it possible to find something else. Uh, one popular thing that happens is removing stop words. Uh, the whole process, I will describe how the documents are being found later, but uh, stop words are kind of those very often appearing words in the language that will mess up your scoring, basically, because uh, something like A will match every single document you have, like every single one. Uh, which is not what we want. I mean, we want to have find relevant content, not every single content. So um, we remove those. Uh, there is a process of called stemming that uh, brings all those words to the same form. Uh, it was jumps, uh, jumps before, it's jump now. Um, and this is what would make this application and app work in this case, the way of having the same tokens both in query and the document. And we and this is being placed in the index. We usually don't use Lucene as is, because that's a library. That's a, there's a language that this library is in. I cannot mention this again, because I thought I will only mention it twice, so yeah. sorry for that. But it's in a very popular language. It's somewhere here. Uh, we use uh, servers like Elasticsearch or Solar, which basically wrap up Lucene and uh, expose the API that you can use for things like this, plus uh, they add some uh, some network, uh, networking stuff, maybe some authorization. So let's use this. Let's make, let's forget about SQL and let's go into uh, Elasticsearch. This is how search is being done. We do a query. This is a very simple query. It's called match query. What happens here is that we take uh, the same analyzer chain we just described, use it on the query itself, and we find documents that uh, match the query. So again, our job is done. We can find everything we wanted to find before, which means uh, we can end here, which is obviously not true because it's only 10 minutes. I, I have to speak more. Um, it's not that easy. And that's the, the, the point we are at, at now here is something that many presentations for crowds like this end, that basically this is how you do search. You set up Elasticsearch, you index data, and you're done. You're not done because that's where the fun starts and that's when I will stop talking about actual technology, so sorry. If, uh, if you're here only for this, <laughs> you can still catch other presentations if you wish. Um, so but let's get back to the examples. Brown fox is lazy, was found. That's great. But uh, <laughs> brown dog over was also found and actually uh, those two are scored the same way. But this was not. And again, I know it's a very contrived example. That was that that was the point, but it's not that uncommon. I mean, you you quite often use different words to describe the same thing. Those are called obviously synonyms. You sometimes use specific words, but and instead of like general ones for the same terms. So there will always be these those cases. And the question is, how can you know which words to use? I mean, there are lists of synonyms, obviously. But for example, if you're having a hardware store and uh, you have parts to some, I know, engine or something, uh, no synonym will make you know that uh, this part is the, for this specific uh, engine. So there's no way for you to like uh, predict generally that this will happen. So we're not over. We still have to think about how to clean up our data. That's, that's the part about we have to know our data. So we have to know what issues are with the data. Again, my example from Brainly is that uh, we. Uh, high, high schoolers, uh, primary schoolers, they usually make a lot of mistakes when they're typing something. When they co are copying the questions, they quite often do not copy the whole one. So we know what are issues with our data, and we, and, and we need to clean, clean the data up. I only mentioned English, and that's a very common example. Everybody speaks English, like I'm doing right now. Sorry, guys. But obviously, there are more languages. And Brainly, we have at least five, I think. And while English is simple, Polish is simplish, uh, there are languages, for example, that don't, don't use spaces. Japanese, for example, is that kind of language that uh, you have to basically guess where the tokens are. And uh, Kuromoji, which is an analyzer for Japanese language uh, uh, in Elasticsearch, actually does that. It tries to predict which words actually might be words and which words are tokens. And it proposes, uh, it's a greedy algorithm basically, it will produce way more tokens than it should, uh, but at least you know that you will have all the tokens uh, to search for. Um, 
like I said, stop words, every language has a different ones, and the uh, funny part is that some stop words aren't even based in the language itself. For example, at Brainly, our users tend to uh, write sentences like, please help, answer quickly, or rate me five stars, or something. Like, there are a lot of those, and they're like, useless, like basically useless, so it makes sense to, to clean them up. And obviously, synonyms I mentioned, and like I, again, those don't have to be direct language-specific synonyms. They might be synonyms inside of your domain, uh, which will be different than the general ones. Uh, like I mentioned, our users uh, make typos, um, so we have to account for those. And there are other features like phrase indexing. For example, we want to make sure that not only the uh, sentences are found, the question is found, uh, I mean the documents are found, but only those, for example, that contain specific wording in specific order. I'll get to that later on. And much, much more. There are two stages to all of this. I mentioned that uh, we have this inverted index. I mentioned that we have a talk analyzer chain and we query against that index. Uh, the part I just described is called retrieval. Retrieval is basically taking a whole, a whole index and selecting those documents that match the query you provided. And once you do that, you have to rank those, 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 uh, uh, those documents. You've probably seen uh, many times that uh, Google, when returns results, it shows like a, some ridiculous number of like 45 million documents found or something, right? Uh, it's not that uh, bad in most uh, indexes you have. But it can be bad. I mean, uh, especially short uh, queries tend to match a lot of documents, which means that the, the act of producing the result, the set of results, is just not enough. Because uh, if you get like 100 of those, it's not feasible to watch, to 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 view every hundred one, uh, every one in the hundred, and uh, decide for yourself which one is the best. That's why we have a phase called ranking. And ranking basically means uh, that. Uh, uh, we have to assign score to each document and then sort uh, those documents based on that score. Uh, the main thing we have for that is called uh, is a, a family of algorithms called uh, TFIDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency, and the one that we mostly use is called BM25 or OCAPI BM25. It's a very simple uh, equation. As you can clearly see, it's obvious what it does. Um, just in case I'm not the only one who had problems with that and didn't understand it fully, uh, it was basically like this. There are two parts of this, uh, of this equation, term frequency, inverse document frequency. Every single document you found in your index gets the score, and the score is designed this way, that each time, uh, each time the term or token appears in the document, the, it's scored higher, but if the, ma the, if the token that was matched is popular in the, in, the, in the index itself, it scores lower. Uh, actually, yeah. sorry. Uh, so for example, if you, have, if you have an index that has a lot of dogs, basically, the dog is a very popular word, if you match the uh, word dog, it means that we will score lower uh, than, for example, it would match the word cat, for example. So we have an index of dogs, somehow there's a single cat, so as this single cat will be ranked higher than uh, all the dogs. I'm a cat person. Uh, and it's not linear yet. There's a, some, some cut off. Uh, I won't, won't go into details because it's not really necessary, but if you really want to see it, you'll find this easily. OK, so like I said, we, first of all, we have query, we have index. We know how to retrieve the data from that index. We know how to sort that data. Obviously, everything is done by our engine. Uh, and here comes the part that is, for me, for at least, um, most interesting one, I mean users. Before we go into users themselves, we need to discuss something else. Um, if you read uh, literature, literature on, uh, on Elasticsearch or, index or, or indexing or search in general, you all, uh, will often find those, those terms, recall and precision. Though, uh, recall and precision are the terms that describe a quality of the data we are finding. Basically, uh, if we imagine our index and imagine our query, uh, at any given time, inside of an index, there's a list of documents that are relevant to the users, and obviously there's a list that is not. Precision is the metric on how, uh, how many of the results we found are actually relevant. So basically, we take all the 
positives from our set and see how many of those were found. And recall is a metric of um, uh, spoilers. And recall basically says uh, how many of the general positives there are in our set. So, for example, if you want to have a very good precision, you will have a very, uh, very strict query that will only find a single document, and that's a 100 precision. But we will, out of all the documents that are relevant to the users, you would find only one, which is, might not be enough. Um, recall, on the other hand, if you want to have the best possible recall, you can just always return all the documents. Obviously, if you return all the documents, all the relevant ones will also be there. I have a question for you. Do, what, which one do you think is more important? Is it precision? Recall? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the uh, um, answer is obviously our favorite one is, is it depends. Um, and example I can give you, it comes from my domain. At Brainly we have a few different searches and one of those is called Instant Answer. It is about uh, user clicking, stopping a photo or writing down the question and getting immediately a single response that is relevant to the, uh, re that is their answer to the question they have. So. In this case, the most important thing we want to have here is precision. We don't care about getting all the results because we're not going to show them. But what we want to have is have an experience that is basically seamless. That's something that users just snaps a photo and, oh, here's the answer. And that's precision. And in this case, precision is like the, the we don't care about recall at all. But if you want to, for example, provide a list of relevant questions to the user on normal search, recall be some, suddenly becomes much more important because uh, you want to give them more context of what they're doing. And general answer to, there is no general answer to this question. It always depends on what are you developing, what are the features, and how do you want users to interact with them. Let's then get back to the uh, definition I, I proposed at the beginning. Uh, it's searching is a process of finding information relevant to the users. Can somebody uh, tell, tell me what is relevant? I mean, what does relevancy mean? If, I, if you learn only a single thing from that lecture, that was it, thank you. Uh, yeah, so relevant depends on the user and depends heavily on the user. And the problem here is that, as you know, computers don't really do well with ambiguity. So we have to codify somehow what this relevancy means. And uh, the best people to answer that question are users. Uh, which means that what we should do and we are doing quite often, and that's a very important part of a, a search relevancy process, is collecting data. So since we, ca if we, ca we can start with bootstrapping the data from so-called subject matter experts, they will tell us when we start, because we don't have data yet, what is relevant, uh, help us uh, judge those things. But at the end, users will tell us the truth when they're using our service which means we have to get this data. And uh, this is actually quite simple at the beginning because you don't have to collect much. Uh, what we you will all quite often find is the name clickstream. Clickstream is a basically a list of, of a single user actions that, compose, that, that composes uh, something called user search session. And if you want to have something like this, we need some data from that event. Obviously, if there's a, a user ID available, that would be cool. Not every user is logged, so we might actually not have it. But if you can, that's awesome. But the great thing, and for example, Google Optimize gives you that, is a session ID. It, the, if you can get all the user actions in a, like a, in a, in a series and have this and see, for example, that user started by entering this question and he didn't find any answers, then uh, he changed some uh, some words in the question, and then only he found answers and clicked the I know third result. That's a very helpful information for us. So, being able to sort of sort this and put this into a, a series, that's awesome. Uh, rec request ID helps. Request ID is something that we can basically use to connect front-end and back-end actions. Uh, back-end usually has a more information and it's more reliable because front-end events are uh, generated in the uh, browser of the user, so uh, they tend to be a different quality and they can basically be lost. Obviously, we want to know what happened, right? So we want to know what was the specific action that user took. 
and general context of the situation, what query was typed, what filters were used, what is the uh, page uh, they are on, and so on. And having something like this, even if you don't have the information about the session I mentioned, you can start working on the search. Because, for example, if you have action that resulted in zero results, that's an information for you. That's the first thing you can have is to take zero results events, see what were the queries that produced those zero events events, and just basically look at them and optimize towards them. Uh, that sounds very manual, I know, but that's how keyword search starts in general. Search sessions are important because they can provide you more, with more details. The example I mentioned before, like being able to connect uh, two separate actions together and see and work on this is important. And you can start like with some user clicking on the search bar or entering the user the search page. Uh, those two events actually, actually are separate because at some places, for example, Wikipedia, do you know that Wikipedia has a search page? I know that not many people actually use search page in Wikipedia, and probably most of you doesn't even know how to look, how to get there. But there's a search page for Wikipedia, and uh, obviously the most common interaction is with the go box, the one on upper right corner, and uh, that's what, if I remember the numbers correctly, it was like 97% of searches come from that go box. They don't even click, you know, uh, the, the 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 button. They just type, select, uh, select the uh, suggestion, and that's it. Uh, and I'm mentioning this because it sort of describes two different users. If you have those users, like 97% of them, they're your basic casual users that will just want to find something. But users who enter search page on Wikipedia are, have a very specific need. And you can set filters there, number of results, and like many, many things. And this is a different group. This is a different target. And obviously, depending on the product, you can have different uh, entry points to the, to the same process. And the most important thing is, we have to know how the search ends. And in most cases, it's some inactivity on the search page. Obviously, rage quitting the search itself and, and, and deciding not to, not to use this, which is mostly bad. You can get a lot of data from that. You can get, uh, and the data that you can get from that is basically in two, in two categories. One is quantitative. Quantitative is your basic information about percentages, numbers, uh, like here, for example, how many search ended with somebody actually getting the results they wanted and, uh, and sticking to our product. And this is important because we, that tells us that we are improving. We introduced a new change in search, and more people are getting what they wanted. That's, that's a success. But if you really think about this, if the situation is reversed, we don't have enough data to know what's actually broken. And that's why quality uh, feedback is uh, as important, because it tells you, for example, that what users were doing. For example, they searched for dogs, and they, the next action they performed was uh, cats. Maybe we have uh, ugly dogs on our page, and you know, we are basically making dog per people, making them cat people. I know. That was a joke. No, 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 laugh. laugh. <laughs> That's a very good question, and uh, <laughs> answer is? It depends. Yes, it depends. I mean, uh, and it's a, it's a complicated one. Uh, it sort of depends on your business, and as in there are actual people who spend all days thinking about what is a successful session. Like, for example, uh, if, I, if somebody only uh, interacted with my page for 15 seconds, is, this a, is that a success or not? Answer is, it depends, because uh, if your business is providing quick answers to people, then probably yes. I mean, 15 seconds, that's awesome. But if you want to engage them for longer, for example, I know, your Facebook, that means 15 seconds is, isn't very good, right? So it all depends, and it all depends on your business, and there are people who actually are supposed to know that. So ask them. Business analysts, they are called, or some variation of that. Um, Getting back to quality data, that's how we know what to improve. If we get this data, we can actually go inside of our index and we can create new synonyms, we can develop new strategies. That's because of that part here. Um, okay. The analysis itself is also, we need to be able to know where to focus. And, uh, one second. And, um, one example thing we do is uh, called head torso tail analysis. We, the, in general terms, 
these are the head tech queries are the ones that uh, are quite are have a highest volume uh, search volume. I mean, uh, for example, if you have a uh, some food chain page or something, word pizza will appear, very, uh, question for pizza might appear very often, like in maps or something. And those are the queries we have to make perfect, basically, because many people use this, and the best part is there are not many of those, so we can actually focus and manually make sure that they're you know, great. Uh, but we also need to understand why we get uh, worse results in the rest of those, and uh, we basically divide those and, and, uh, and apply different strategies for all those. But those those always have to work. Like head queries are the most important ones um, because uh, they're easy to they're mostly easy to do. Because I mean, pizza is very general, but it's not often used. So we can actually tailor results for pizza and make sure like some uh, so that the best pizza restaurants are there or or anything else. Sessions also help with more things like uh, you know. This example, like, you can actually boost some t words in the query because you know that, uh, for example, it's uh, winter uh, season and there are some exams coming, so we know that some documents uh, are better suited for this part of the year than the others. So we can use that based on your sessions. Uh, you can adjust importance of fields uh, that you're that you're using. And obviously, the most important part for me, at least, is that you can pinpoint data issues you have. You can see, for example, the easiest thing you can do, take your zero results queries, uh, events, and see why they are like this, and analyze them to see what issues with the data you have. And unless you're doing a, like a fully created uh, index, you probably have data issues. Search strategies based is how we search, uh, how we, what type of queries we use uh, to return data from the index, and uh, that's why, why, why we use uh, sessions. I will destroy this. And I will not be talking about machine learning, sorry. Uh, the whole process looks based something like this. There's this small circle here, uh, is that, and that's the place where we take a set of queries, so we see what the results are, we try to get uh, information on what should be the perfect results for those, for those queries, we change strategies, on the in the offline we evaluate it on some set, uh, checking some metrics, we do it quite a few times, and then we do a big loop. So we start an A-B testing experiment, one with the previous strategy, one with the new one, we gather the click stream, we, uh, we analyze the data, and we integrate the analyzed data into the process again to you know, re repeat this. It's a, it's a it very manual process, it may seem, but uh, there's actually a reason for this. Uh, many of those things simply cannot be done automatically, and if they can be done automatically, uh, there's a way of doing that uh, actually with machine learning, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. Okay, so I mentioned the technical parts you need. I mentioned... Uh, uh, what is the process we uh, usually use to uh, improve our search engine? What, what kind of skills we actually have, have to have in the team? Not a single person. Not a single person can do all of those things. But what we what we start with subject matter expertise. I mentioned this. If we start doing search, we don't know yet what is the good data, what are the good results. So no, we know we need to have people who understand that. Obviously, user events data analysis. Uh, Business intelligence is what I mentioned before. So business intelligence is so that you know which answer, which uh, results are, are are successful for you, how your business uh, grows. And the research is something I just mentioned. And obviously there's a lot of backend development. I mean, those services are written in some languages, they're deployed, they're maintained, and so on. So there's still backend here, but it's sort of a much more broader. Like you, you have to understand how, how users think, and you have to be able to codify this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will not talk about machine learning. So, actually, I was curious, I don't have enough time. So, what we have right now is a thing we call keyword search. Uh, uh, sorry, keyword search. Uh, keyword search uh, does, uh, it's called this way because you take keywords, those are your terms, and you match them together and return results based on them. Um, it is cool. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's always, uh, it works uh, in many, many cases. But there are more things you can do. And you probably heard about machine learning. Uh, you heard about maybe some of you heard about vector search. So there are other ways you can do, other things you can do, than doing a plain keyword search I just described. But before you do that, 
the whole manual part of the process I described is necessary to make sure that, first of all, you have a good quality data that you, use, that you users search for, and you have a measurement system, you, you gather events, sessions, and so on, that you can rely on. Because right now is the place that you can start automating this. But if you do this without making sure that those things work, and you make sure that it works by doing this manually, this means that this system will produce better results. Automatically, but better results. So that's where we, where, where we are. That's our basic keyword search. What we can do afterwards is understand more about data itself. I mean, for example, uh, it's cool to understand what are the relations, what are the entities we have. Um, for example, in Brainly, there are you know, definitions, there are, uh, there are exercises, uh, some definitions talk about things that are in some sort of taxonomy. Uh, understand that this helps us get better search because we can expand the user query based on that. Uh, Expansion is not only about that, but it also can, can have personalization. It also can have, uh, like I said, seasonality. For example, midterms are coming, so we can provide results that are relevant to that part of year. Uh, and learning to rank is the automation I described. So this is a process of taking the data you have, doing an automated process based on machine learning that will sort of provide weights to your documents uh, based on the queries you have and the queries that come from the system. But like I said, you have to have a very good quality, both data and measuring system to do that. And the thing you will probably hear often going forward is semantic or vector search. It's actually a very different way of searching that uses uh, uh, vector space and similarity to find documents that are meaningful towards, uh, towards each other. I won't go into detail here because it's a very huge subject, uh, but it's gaining traction. Uh, I was at the search conference two weeks ago, and it's like 70% of lectures were about uh, vector search, which was annoying, actually. Um, but it's not that semantic search or vector search is like an end all be all, the final solution to search, because the, there are still cases semantic search won't, won't deal very well, and in general, you will use all of those even if you have a perfect search. It's always good to have a mixture of those things because different places, different business needs have a different, uh, different requirements and everything of this can be helpful. So, that's not enough. I know that. I wanted to do a sort of like an overview of what search engineering entails, like from A to Z, but it's more like A to C. Uh, so, obviously, if you want to know more, uh, you will have to Oh, read. And if you really want to read, uh, by the way, I will have a QR code with all the links so you don't have to like, f follow up everything. There's one in the end. Uh, I would recommend this book. Relevant Search is uh, also an overview of the uh, relevancy process, but much, much more in depth. And uh, these guys are awesome. Like, I mean, they're like alpha some girls in the search world. So, and it's a very well written book. And even if you don't know nothing about search, it will guide you through very gently. And there are examples in Elasticsearch and Solar, so I would recommend that. Once you read that and decide that's for you, uh, time to do some data managing. I would recommend if you want to have like indexes to uh, have fun with, I would recommend to go Wikipedia dumps. Uh, Wikipedia drops every single data they have uh, periodically. You can just download this and you know index it uh, to your application. Um, if uh, you have all of this and you want to get some more help or talk with other like-minded people because right now you're hooked and you want to be a search engineer, I recommend uh, going to Slack. There's a uh, channel. Uh, there's a Slack called Relevance and Matching Text in Slack. Everybody that's ever like. Uh, been known for doing searches probably there. And uh, people are very welcoming. You can, there are no stupid questions and so on. It's, it's, it's an awesome place. Uh, if you want to go a bit further and, for example, start the fun with learning to rank and stuff like this, uh, or uh, natural language processing, I recommend Kaggle datasets. Uh, they have quite a, quite a few of those and quite a big ones as well. Uh, so those are quite nice to use. So, that's the, that's the thing. So basically, if you want to play with this, you have to have uh, data, and uh, both Wikipedia and Kaggle is, is an awesome source. And like I said, mentioned, mentioned QR code, I'll stop here. Uh, I'm on time. So, 
the thing I wanted uh, you to know is not to how to do search. I'm not, not expecting anybody to just like walk out of here, uh, install Elasticsearch, and uh, you know prepare something that that makes sense. Uh, but at some point in my career, for example, I decided I don't really want to specialize in a single thing as much as many of my friends did, and. Search engineering gave me this opportunity to touch different subjects. You cannot be a good search engineer if you are only focused on the backend part of this. You cannot be a good search engineer if you understand users but don't understand the engines, technology behind this, and so on. So if you ever had this like feeling that maybe a deep specialization is not what you want to do, search engineering is perfect for that because it will allow you to touch a very different subjects and have this understanding of the process from A to Z. And this is where I want to leave with. Thank you. What new attention? Are children your UX designers? Uh, no. Uh, uh, no, they're not, but. Um, uh, in general, that, yeah, that's, a, that's a complicated thing. Uh, I mean, s many people think that subject matter experts are actually, you know, users, and that's not true. I, that's that's almost never true. Subject matter experts are people who can understand users rather than be with them, because every single user has a lot only part of a picture, and if there's only a part of that that, for example, I do prefer uh, using uh, Allegro in the way that I'm using some filters, and from my perspective, that's the only way how people use this, because that's the only way how I'm using this. So subject matter expert is not really a user, it's a user that is a person that understands those. So we don't need people, uh, kids, to actually understand this, but uh, we can have subject matter experts who can help our designers design something that makes sense for them. And then test, obviously. We do A-B tests, quite a lot, and uh, to see if things basically clicked. Uh, so the question was uh, if uh, Elasticsearch, for example, provides us with the tooling needed for the uh, stuff I just described. The short answer is no. Um, uh, yeah, damn it. <laughs> okay, uh, but it's a uh, question part. It's all, all presentations over. Uh, so uh, it sort of does, but you, do, you won't. You wouldn't like to use them. Uh, I mean, there's an API that helps with relevance, but it's terrible. I spoke with Phil Philip from Elastic yesterday, and he said himself said that it's terrible. So, if the <laughs> creators of that tool think so, I am excused. But there are other tools. For example, one called Cupid. Uh, it's Q U E P I D. Uh, I should should have this. Uh, it's a tool that allows you to create things that's called uh, judgment list. Judgment list is basically a set of uh, queries that, is, that has a set of answers attached to it with some scoring. For example, for who is Napoleon, we have those, this, those results, and those uh, answers are the best ones, those are the, and they give, get a score of four, and so on. And this tool is something you can use to try, your, try out your search uh, strategies and see how well they stack against the other. Uh, so Cupid, I would definitely recommend. That would probably be the second step. Um, that's for the, uh, you know, the improvement part. But for data analysis, um, there's Logstash. Uh, actually, Elasticsearch has a very simple engine called Ingest to also analyze, uh, to also like prepare your data. But generally, uh, you would rather have something more, more dedicated. Obviously, the analysis part is inside Elasticsearch. So if you can do something with analysis, do it, because otherwise you will have to just repeat that for every query and, and so on. So that makes sense, but generally, uh, I wouldn't recommend, like for example, the relevancy API you have there, because no, it's unusable. Questions, other questions, other questions? Question? Hmm? Oh, okay. okay, thank you again.